Hello everyone, in the last general chemistry video we learned about the stoichiometry behind balancing chemical equations and the different molar ratios and relationships we can derive through a correctly balanced chemical equation, while also working through one or two example problems. Since this topic is very crucial to stoichiometry and future principles we're going to explore together, I thought it would be necessary if we spent more time on doing practice problems. So throughout this video, I want to dive into three unique examples of balancing a chemical equation, building a molar relationship, and finding the limiting reactants. In our first example, let's work with the reaction of silicon tetrachloride with water to form salicylic acid and hydrochloric acid. Before moving forward, we have to make sure our reaction is balanced, or else all the work and relationship we build from here on out would be incorrect. In order to check, if the reaction is balanced or needs to be balanced, we have to make sure that there is an equal amount of atoms in the reactants and products. In the reactants, to the left of the reaction arrow, we have one silicon atom and four chlorine atoms in silicon tetrachloride. In addition, we have eight hydrogen atoms and four oxygen atoms and four moles of water. On the product side, we have four hydrogens, one silicon atom, and four oxygen atoms in salicylic acid while having four hydrogens and four chlorine atoms and four moles of hydrochloric acid for a total of one silicon, four chlorine, eight hydrogen, and four oxygen atoms on both sides of the products and reactants. So our reaction is correctly balanced. So we can move forward with our question. What would the limiting reactant be if we had 0.63 liters of water and a starting weight of 0.3 grams of silicon tetrachloride? Let's start with finding how much product each one of these starting conditions can create. Remember, in order to have an aggregate comparison, we need to compare the amount of product formed of the same product. So in this case, let's compare the amount of salicylic acid produced. Starting with converting grams of silicon tetrachloride to moles of silicon tetrachloride, we rely on the molecular weight of the molecule, which is derived by summing up the atomic weights of all atoms in the molecule. Once we have converted to moles, we can rely on building a relationship from our balanced chemical equation, multiplying moles of silicon tetrachloride by one, since in this case it's a one-to-one -one ratio of one mole of silicon tetrachloride to one mole of salicylic acid. Now through that conversion, we have moles of salicylic acid. Converting to grams, using the molecular weight of salicylic acid, we have a total of 0.53 grams of salicylic acid produced from 0.34 grams of silicon tetrachloride. Next is water, but in this case, our measurement of our starting conditions of water is in liters. No need to worry, we just need to rely on the density of water to convert from volume to weight. In this case, the density of water is 1 gram of water per mil. Since our starting conditions is in liters, our dimensional analysis scheme for the amount of salicylic acid produced from 0.63 liters of water is going to rely on converting liters to milliliters and converting volume to grams of water. 0.63 liters of water multiplied by 1000 to solve for milliliters, then by 1 since the density of water is 1 gram per mil. Now we have grams of water. We can divide by the molecular weight of 18.06 grams of water per mole to solve for moles of water. Then multiply by the ratio of 1 over 4 since from our balanced chemical equation it's 4 moles of water per mole of salicylic acid. And just like in the last conversion we can convert to moles of salicylic acid to grams for a total of 2.31 times 10 to the third grams of salicylic acid produced from 6.3 liters of water. 0.34 grams of silicon tetrachloride produces 0.53 grams of salicylic acid, whereas 0.63 liters of water produces 2.31 times 10 to the third grams of salicylic acid. So in this case, it's easy to see that silicon tetrachloride is a limiting reactant and will be used up entirely before the water is. In our next question, let's see if we could take it one step further and find the amount of excess reactant remaining after the limiting reactant is used up. This is what we call as the reaction going to completion. In our next question, we are working with the equation of ammonia reacting with oxygen to form nitrogen monoxide in water. 
As always, we first have to check if the reaction is balanced before moving forward. In the reactants, we have 4 moles of nitrogen, 12 moles of hydrogen, 10 moles of oxygen, and in the products, we have 4 moles of nitrogen, 12 moles of hydrogen, and 10 moles of oxygen for a complete balanced chemical reaction. The reaction is now balanced. Now we can analyze the questions. What is the limiting reactant if we have 16.46 kilograms of ammonia reacting with 19.25 kilograms of oxygen? And how much of the excess reactant is left if the reaction has gone to completion? Completion meaning that the reaction is allowed to continue until the limiting reactant is all used up. In order to work with this problem, we first need to find which of the two reactants is the limiting one under these starting conditions. So let's compare them with the amount of nitrogen monoxide each one can produce. This is a key example of paying attention to units. Our starting conditions are in kilograms, so we have to make sure to convert to grams in order to convert to moles or else our answers will be off by a scale of a thousand. Starting with 16.46 kilograms of ammonia, we will multiply by a thousand to convert to grams, then divide by the molecular weight of 17.031 grams per mole to achieve moles of ammonia. Relying now on the molar relationships of the balanced chemical equation, we can multiply by 1 since the ratio of ammonia to nitrogen monoxide is 4 to 4 moles. Now with moles of nitrogen monoxide, we use the molecular weight of 30.01 grams per mole to convert grams of nitrogen monoxide to moles. Since I like converting to the units we were starting with in this problem, we can divide by 1000 to gain a total of 29 kilograms of nitrogen monoxide produced from 16.46 kilograms of ammonia. Now repeating similar steps but with oxygen, we will convert kilograms to grams, grams to moles of oxygen, moles of oxygen to moles of nitrogen monoxide by multiplying by the ratio of 4 moles of nitrogen monoxide over 5 moles of oxygen, converting moles of nitrogen monoxide to grams, then to kilograms for a total of 14.44 kilograms of nitrogen monoxide produced from 19.25 kilograms of oxygen. So, we have 29 kilograms of nitrogen monoxide produced from 16.46 kilograms of ammonia and 14.44 kilograms produced from 19.25 kilograms of oxygen. Under these starting conditions, we can see that oxygen produced the less amount of nitrogen monoxide and it will be the limiting reactant. Now that we know this, we can use a very similar but not identical stoichiometric analysis to find the amount of ammonia 19.25 kilograms of oxygen will react with. So we will convert kilograms of oxygen to grams, grams to moles of oxygen, then multiply it by a ratio of 4 over 5. 4 moles of ammonia over 5 moles of oxygen from our balanced chemical equation. Then convert to grams of ammonia and finally kilograms for a total of 8.197 kilograms of ammonia used up in the reaction with 19.25 kilograms of oxygen. And finally, in order to find the amount of excess reactant, we would just need to subtract the amount used from our starting conditions. So, 16.46 kilograms of ammonia subtracted by 8.187 kilograms used up for a total of 8.26 kilograms of ammonia remaining after the reaction is allowed to go to completion. This is the amount of ammonia that will be left over after the limiting reactant is used up. For our last question, I'm not trying to go too much into detail through the conversion, since I think it will be beneficial for you guys to break down the new question by yourselves. Yet I just want to make one point with this question. I added this question in particular because I wanted to show that even though we have three reactants in the process, the process of solving the question is the same. We just need to compare the three reactants and how much each of them will produce of the products. Well, all in all, I truly hope these practice problems help with your future studies in chemistry. And remember, all of them can be downloaded for free over on my website. And if you want to take a closer analysis of them, I wish you guys have a great day.